Since we started last winter, we've shipped one game to iOS and completed our first three game jams. Throughout this, we've tried several camera systems, from what most tutorials recommended, to plugins, and to custom solutions that just didn't get the job done. Today, I'm sharing our best system yet. So, there are a thousand different ways to make a camera system, and many games have their own unique way. That's exactly why making your own cater to your needs is a smart thing to do, especially for a long-term project. See, some games will just lock the camera entirely, and that can actually make development a lot easier because the restriction simplifies level design and there's virtually no camera logic. Then other games will just do a basic rig where the camera is locked to the player. And then you can get a little more complex when you start adding stuff like drag margins, which makes the camera movement less distracting for precision platforming, or camera lead so that you can see farther in the direction that you're moving. Many games also restrict or limit the camera to certain positions. This is both to frame the scene better, and also to avoid seeing out of bounds. So you might think, great, Godot's camera 2D node already supports limits out of the box, as well as drag margins, smoothing, offsets, and more. So why would I need to make a custom, modular system to support this? Valid argument, and you can get away with the native logic, but let's say we just try to use the native limits as an example. Well maybe I want the limit to adjust though, like what if I move down a tile? Okay, cool, it lets me set the limits at runtime, so maybe whenever I hit the floor I can just set it then, kind of like in Donkey Kong. Okay, fine, but what about my walls? I'll just set those and, well, shoot, my map is in a perfect rectangle, and I want these limits to adjust now. Maybe I can just raycast to dynamically set the limits and account for these odd shapes. On second thought, maybe we just stick to rectangles. This room is pretty small, and I want limits on these walls to keep the camera centered in this passageway. Oh, but what if I want ultra-wide support? Do I need an extra set of limits just for that? The different aspect ratio might overflow. The point is, things get messy fast. Whenever anyone's Godot project starts to demand things that aren't natively supported, things get interesting. A common pitfall is that people will use a plugin, as so many videos recommend. And I'm not bashing all plugins, but they are kind of a crutch to use in production and are often bloated. As a previous user of plugins like Phantom Camera, a popular choice and impressive software, I seriously can't recommend it or any other camera plugin if you are serious about creating a big project. Even for something as small as a game jam entry, it has led to unexpected behavior which only came to light after we submitted. If you want to really tap into Godot's benefits, you need to make yourself custom systems that cater to your needs. Any level of uncertainty in your infrastructure gives you no benefits and just more to worry about. Like one time, we had an issue where web builds couldn't render a certain type of particle, but only for certain GPU architectures. It's crazy. Not to mention, these do-it-all plugins, like Phantom Camera, are adding a lot of gunk. You're loading 3D logic you don't care about, excess 2D features you'll never need, and it makes your games download larger. So this is why you should make your own systems, and this goes for a lot more than just cameras. It's really not that hard, too. As you expand your custom infrastructure, you can also start adding to a personal template repo like we do. So whenever you make your next prototype, because all devs have a project graveyard, you can carry all of that infrastructure with you. Camera systems, state machines, hit detection, scene transitions, common shaders, particles, you name it. So after exploring way too many options, we made a camera system that has allowed us to do the following. We can create dynamic zones, which restrict the camera how we want it to be, define zone transitions however we like, use an extensible type system for the different area types, interpolate between different zoom levels, work with any aspect ratio since we limit by the center point, tweak custom drag margins, smoothing, leading positions, and we can easily build upon it, like add a custom shake function, or we even stole the peak mechanic from Team Cherry. Plus, all you need to do to define an area is just draw two shapes. Okay, so here's the rundown. Again, the code is down below if you want to follow along. First, under our level scene, we begin with a Node2D to hold all of our zones. Next, a second Node2D which will become our camera area object. First, we can quickly turn the base zone into a scene for reproducibility. This camera area then receives two polygons, which will define our jurisdiction and boundary zones. The jurisdiction is the zone that this camera area is active for if the player is within it. But why Polygon2D and not Area2D if we're detecting the player? Well, sometimes spawning in a collision shape won't register the initial entry. Also, the player's collision shape is 2D, not 1D, so they could register in two zones at once if you put them too close. This also causes potential for it to flip back to the zone you came from, and then you end up off-camera. 
To try and fix this, you could constantly check the overlapping bodies of the zones, but at that point you may as well just use the Godot geometry library and query a polygon instead. Plus, Polygon 2D makes for a nice debug visual. Anyways, next, the boundary polygon simply defines the limit that binds the camera's center position. So now we have a zone, let's give it a global group and make some scripts. We'll need one script for the camera area and another for the camera itself. In Stub, our camera exists as a child of the player, but is marked as top level since it's controlled by code and shouldn't inherit any transform. Starting with the camera script, we can outline behavior to fetch all of the active camera areas by using the group that we made. For Stub, we just do this once in the ready function and hold a reference to them. Then in our camera's process function, we will need to determine which area the player is in. So let's start by grabbing their global position. Now let's step into our camera area code and we can add a simple function to check if a point is within its jurisdiction. We can export our zones and use isPointInPolygon from the Geometry 2D library for this. But what's the runtime here? Well, worst case, it needs to check against every edge of the shape. So if we have a lot of zones and each zone's polygon is complex, that can get pretty expensive. To address this, as part of the areas ready function, we can pre-compute a helpful rect2 to speed this up drastically. Now we can use the much more efficient haspoint function from rect2, which only checks the two corner points. That'll give us an early exit for almost every zone check. Okay, so now that we know which area we're in, let's figure out how it's restricting the camera. We can define this as the bound position in the camera script and we can make a new method under our camera area to determine where that is. But first, we need to figure out where our desired camera position is. Let's say the camera is unbounded. Where would our unrestricted camera place itself? Now for this, you could just make the desired position be on the player and keep it simple. But for Stub, we wanted it to be a bit fancier. We wanted it to be a little offset upwards and thought it would be nice to have some sort of look ahead so we can see more in the direction that Stub is moving. The vertical offset is simple, that's just taking the player's position and moving it up a bit. And then this look ahead logic can just leverage the velocity of the player. If they're moving to the right, we can move our horizontal offset over to the right, vice versa. Here's where you would add other things like drag margins with equally basic logic. Now we can take our desired position where the camera wants to be and confine it to get our bound position. If the desired position is in the boundary already, then it's good to go. If not, we can use get closest point to segment from the geometry class on its edges to find the closest available position. Now that we know where the camera is restrained to, all that's left is to linearly interpolate the camera position to be there. You can also just set it directly and not lerp it if you don't want your camera gliding about. Okay, so that's really the entire foundation, and I'll be including an abridged version of these scripts with only that core logic as well. But how can we expand upon this? Well, first, for modular zone types, we made an enum export for the area type. For example, we wanted a different zone from one the camera should lock on for a focal point. And in a focus area, it'll have a marker 2D instead of a polygon. All of the logic is the same, the only difference is that when you request your bound position, it'll simply return that point's coordinates. Other zone types you could make could maybe have the camera follow a line, like in a movie set, or maybe elicit a special effect, like revealing a secret area. Anything, really. Our next addition was customizing the transitions between zones, which, for us, involved exporting some tween settings that define panning behavior, uh, nothing crazy. Then we made a zoom export for each area and interpolate it for the camera. So now it's zooming in on this focus zone and zooming back out when we leave. It works great for big open areas too that you want to zoom out for. As previously mentioned, ultra-wide support is nice, but you don't want it to overflow horizontally. To fix this, you would just need to use Godot's geometry logic to shrink the horizontal component of the boundary zones in your ready function, according to the aspect difference. Lastly, we threw in a basic, easily triggerable screen shake effect, a super simple peak control, and debug visuals with an in-editor button to help tell how 16x9 screens get their edges limited. You can add all of these in your own, better way, but I still included our implementation in the code. So there you have it, a basic yet powerful camera system providing modular, highly customizable camera behavior that is efficient in doing so. We've taken the time to profile its performance, and its impact is negligible. We hope you learned something, and if you want help with your system design or want to follow the progress of Stub and become a tester, then check the Discord link in the description. Thanks for watching.